So as I mentioned before, um, Professor Riera isn't here today. Um, I'll be delivering the lecture and then it's up to you if you're in his section, um, wh which section you'd like to attend, uh, mine or Ning's. Um, uh, Ning's is in East Pine 039 and mine is in Makash B13, which is down in the basement. Um, so today, and did everyone get a handout? Make sure that everyone got a Okay, so um, today we'll be discussing um, Missing Person by Patrick Modiano. And um, I've titled my uh, lecture um, Patrick Modiano, um, Patrick Modiano's Missing Person, Detective of History, Detective of Memory. In Dora Bruder, 1997, arguably Modiano's masterpiece, the exterior walls of a Parisian apartment building are described as being the color of amnesia. Amnesia, along with a subsequent search to retrieve fragments of identity lost to the trauma of World War II, the Nazi occupation of France, and their aftermaths, color much of Modiano's body of work. The drab atmosphere of the anonymous Parisian neighborhoods in which many of Modiano's works are situated, environs rife with untold stories of devastation and survival, function as an anti-locus amoinus or garden of Eden. These haunted zones are infused with the willful and or involuntary amnesia that runs throughout Modiano's texts in which historical and individual memory becomes a fog, literal and metaphorical, shrouding the protagonists and in which they stumble, searching for pieces of their pasts that, once found, they believe will make them whole again. Modiano raises many questions, including the following. Is it possible to recover the past? Is it possible to reconcile one's current existence with the scars of long forgotten or repressed events? In Modiano's Rue des Boutiques Obscures, translated into English as missing person, a detective who has lost his memory and has been given the name Guy Roland is a paradoxical figure who encapsulates this arch Modianian juxtaposition of memory and forgetting. Roland, suffering from amnesia for a decade, takes it upon himself to recover his identity. This journey takes him through la nuit des temps, the night of time, across continents, nationalities, and languages. I will consider the representation of amnesia in missing person as it relates not only to Roland's complex story, but also to the historical, but also to the memory of World War II, which casts a long shadow on the text despite its post-war setting. In doing so, I will examine the role played by photography in Roland's quest for his true self. However, before I begin, I will briefly discuss Modiano's literary production in order to situate missing person within that context. Of Patrick Modiano's writings, William van der Wolk has commented that they are, and I cite, postmodern detective stories with no clear crime, suspect, or resolution. End of citation. Along similar lines, Martin Gallo Bender writes that, quote, Modiano's novels can be seen as postmodern fables, stories that spring from our common heritage and tell us truths about the past that enable us to move forward into the future. As much as Modiano's works turn towards the past, they do so in order to transcend those events. End of citation. Modiano's novels can also be read in a psychoanalytic manner. Juliette Dickstein contends that, quote, Modiano's apparent obsession with recollecting the occupation is similar to the way trauma victims compulsively recall their violently disturbing experiences, and that, consequently, Modiano's compulsion to repeat, which manifests itself in his writing, can be viewed within a Freudian psychoanalytic context. End of quote. 
These statements demonstrate that classifying Modiano's texts is a difficult task, since many of his novels are hybrid works in terms of both literary genre, many of them can fall into multiple categories, including novel, detective story, historical fiction, autobiography, elegy, graphic novel, and plot. In most of his texts, there are two plots, reminiscent, of course, of Todorov's notion of the double plot of the detective story, which we've been discussing a lot this semester. For example, in Dora Bruder, the temporal jumps back and forth, as well as the merging of past and present, resonate with Modiano's personal identification with Dora, a teenage girl who has gone missing. In searching for her, Modiano is effectively discovering himself. Indeed, the merging of these two lives in this text is an embodiment of the classic double plot of Todorov's typology of detective fiction, namely the tale of the crime and that of the investigation, which correspond to the récit, the narrative of the crime, and to the histoire, the story of the investigation. Within histoire, however, is inscribed the intertwining personal histories of Dora and Modiano, as well as the historical periods in which these two subjects came of age, both overshadowed by war. World War II, in the case of Dora, and Algeria for the young Modiano. Victoria Bridges, whose article in Yale French Studies we read for today, agrees with Van der Wolk's assessment of Modiano, writing that, quote, at a casual first glance, Modiano's works are reminiscent of the best detective stories or mystery novels, end of citation. Yet Bridges also notes that, quote, something else is at stake in Modiano's oeuvre. To cite Martine Gaillot Bender again, post-Holocaust Jewish identity and legacy are at stake in Modiano's earlier works, um, including uh, Missing Person. A cursory look at some of Modiano's most well-known titles partially reveals more of his other preoccupations in his literary production. Night Rounds, 1969. The Ring Boulevards, 1972. The Sad Villa, 1975. Family Album, 1977. The Street of Obscure Boutiques, also translated as Missing Person, 1978, Memory Lane, 1981, The Lost Neighborhood, 1984, Flowers of Ruin, 1991, Out of the Dark, 1996, The Unknown Women, 2003. Loss, Sadness, Nighttime, Ruin, Pain, Obscurity, Family Memory, circularity, forgetting, all inscribed onto the Parisian cityscape and almost always related to the occupation of France are some of the recurrent elements in Modiano's body of work, particularly the haunting of spaces in the text that is part and parcel of most of Modiano's protagonists' investigations. The lieu de mémoire, sites of memory, of which Pierre Nora, the French historian, has written, and it's, it's on your handout, um, found throughout Modiano's texts become both the scene of the crime as well as the scene of the investigation. Modiano's narrator protagonists wander, retracing their steps as well as those of whom they search, often at dusk, in the liminal time between day and night, through a Paris that is gray, eerie, completely strange and familiar at once. Like Paris, so too is Nice a, quote, city of ghosts and specters, according to one of the characters in Missing Person, uh, page 32. According to one critic, quote, mystery and melancholy, two words that could be used to sum up the atmosphere of Modiano's work. End of citation. In the words of another scholar, Modiano's literary production is very monolithic. The French author Michel Tournier's 1978 remark that one could compile a single book 
from all of Modiano's novels is not outdated. It has been followed by many similar observations from critic, including one who states that Modiano regularly serves the same soup." End of quote. Yet the French reading public apparently enjoys partaking of this same soup, since each of Modiano's novels is an unparalleled success on both the critical and commercial levels. Modiano is a prolific, best-selling author who has become nearly an institution for readers of French contemporary literature. He has a dedicated following, and his books are eagerly anticipated, read, and discussed. Each of Modiano's publications are literary events, and Modiano is something of a literary icon or celebrity. Since the start of his career, when he burst on the literary scene at the age of 23, his publications have been lauded by the public and have also received most of the major French literary prizes. Um, his first novel, La Place de l'Etoile, published in 1968, won two prizes while Missing Person won the Prix Goncourt in 1978, arguably the most prestigious prize of all in France. Modiano has also co-written with Louis Malle the 1974 film La Combe Lucien, also referenced on your sheet, dealing, not surprisingly, with the occupation of France and one young man's coming of age in a journey from attempts at resistance to collaboration with the Nazis. Indeed, according to another scholar, quote, Modiano has now become a legend, just as Balzac, who we've often mentioned in, in class, uh, is recalled for his passion for life's pleasures, Modiano's legend rests upon his fascination with the past, a fascination that has less to do with the pretense of representing past events than with evoking the ways in which individuals relate to their past and the ways in which language is put to use to get to this past. End of citation. My focus today is on the investigation of history and memory taken up by the detective who has been rechristened as Guy Roland, the narrator protagonist of Missing Person. In Missing Person, Roland, a private detective who has suffered from amnesia for years, tries to recover his identity and his past. In so doing, he attempts to address and redress the experience of the occupation of France, especially its lingering traces into his and the other character's present day existence. Like most of Modiano's narrator protagonists, in following up on leads taken from clues such as photographs, items from old newspapers, letters, postcards, telephone books, phone numbers, society directories, as well as interviews with witnesses from an array of national and cultural backgrounds, Roland launches an investigation into his past, trying to discover as well as recover who he is. As Roland states on page three of the text, quote, I'm following something up. Yes, my past. However, this declaration is met with skepticism by Hutt, Roland's boss, who is retiring from the private detective business. In Hutt's words, quote, I always thought that one day you would try to find your past again. But look here, Guy, I wonder if it is really worth it. Hutt's question of whether uncovering the past is really worth the effort underlies much of Missing Person, as well as Modiano's oeuvre, his body of work as a whole, not so much because of the possibility of what one will find in excavating history and memory, but rather the endless search for what will not be found, what will remain buried, what cannot be excavated from the ruins of history and memory. Rather than heeding Hutt's words, Roland embarks upon a literal and ontological quest to recuperate history and memory. In this respect, the act of detection in Missing Person mimics the autobiographical project, the recreation from fragmented sources of an autobiography that cannot be separated from its historical context. According to Maria Warheim, Modiano fuses the detective story with a seemingly incompatible genre, autobiography. In Modiano, the linear narrative of autobiography meets the circular structure of the detective novel, 
taking readers beyond Rub Grier's The Erasers into a world in which they are left with the impression that the author's life has been one long detective story. End of quote. In attempting to pierce through the fog of his life experiences, Roland treads into the murky territory of the history of the Nazi occupation of France during the Second World War. His quest to uncover his past takes him first throughout the labyrinthine streets of Paris, with which he is familiar, yet from which he feels estranged, and then far away from France and Europe to the Pacific island of Padipi near Bora Bora in Polynesia. Yet for all of his relentless searching, questioning, and wandering, Roland never finds himself. He will never possess basic, basic self-knowledge such as his real name. At the novel's end, he remains Guy Roland, a fabricated identity, a quote, ghost hovering in the tepid air. Page 40, the text. By the end of Missing Person, Roland has seemingly raised more questions about himself and what he has lost to historical memory than he had at the beginning of the text. In this respect, Missing Person diverges from traditional examples of classic or golden age detective fiction that seeks, through a seemingly straightforward and unbroken plotline, to explain not only how a crime was committed, but also to reveal the importance of narrative closure. The ending of the detective story must be a finished answer to the riddle, must enact an unmasking of the criminal or criminals, and must contain an explanation of all that has occurred. Um, there is no such narrative closure in Missing Person, and no hope for it. To cite Martin Goyot Bender, quote, in spite of the visible characteristics of detective fiction that might lead readers to expect some form of closure from Modiano, things are not simple, not any simpler than on the autobiographical level, end of quote. The autobiographical and detection projects will not be resolved in this text, nor in most of Modiano's text, which enact an indictment of history. History is the criminal. History is guilty. Yet no punishment will be enacted upon history. No retribution will take place. In Modiano's words in Dora Bruder, history and time are, quote, everything that defiles and destroys you, end of quote. They are to be evaded escaped as much as possible, for there is no mechanism of justice that can go back in time and rewrite the past. That Roland's queries about himself remain unanswered and moreover are unanswerable is reflected in missing person ending on a note of uncertainty with a question, one that is apparently universal, and I cite from the text, do not our lives dissolve into the evening as quickly as this grief of childhood? Unable to pinpoint the specificities of his own life experiences, Roland, at the end of the book, returns to the general finitude of the human condition, to the eventual ending of all lives. Do not our lives dissolve in the evening? In blending himself with the fabric of humanity, Roland, nameless, without a past, present, or future, becomes part of the human community. He includes himself in it, our lives. He may not know or find his identity, but he can at least identify with the common human woes of grief, of mortality of a past slipping away into the darkness of the evening, the quintessential Modianian hour. This darkness is inscribed in the work's original French title, Rue des Boutiques Obscures, Street of the Dark Boutiques. This very title is an intertextual reference to Georges Perec's 1973 work, La Boutique Obscure 
uh, which is cited on your sheet. Perec's work is a compendium of his dreams from the years 1968 to 1973. So too is Roland's story in Missing Person imbued with a dream-like quality. As he mentions on page 40, quote, I had the unpleasant sensation that I was dreaming. Moreover, Missing Person's opening phrase, quote, I am nothing, is reminiscent again of Georges Perec, this time his 1975 memory, memoir, Double V, or The Memory of Childhood, which begins with the, with the claim, quote, I have no childhood memories. Interesting. Uh, yet Perec is not the only author to whom Modiano pays homage in his oeuvre. Modiano stands on the shoulders of his literary forebears, if somewhat self-consciously. Consider that the title of Modiano's very first novel, La Place de l'Etoile, is effectively stolen from the French surrealist Robert Desnaux, a member of the resistance who died in the concentration camp Terezin in 1945, the year of Modiano's birth. A leading figure in Parisian artistic circles, Desnaux's La Place de l'Etoile was published posthumously, a few months after his death. According to Modiano in Dora Bruder, quote, I had no idea that Desnos had written a book called La Place de l'Etoile. Quite unwittingly, I had stolen his title from him. End of quote. Not only had Modiano stolen the title of this book, but also the form and content of La Place de l'Etoile bear the unmistakable mark of Romain Gary's influence, and Romain Gary is discussed on your sheet, um, particularly his Holocaust comedies written under the pseudonym of Émile Ajar. Finally, one of this text's pro protagonists, Dr. Bardamou, is a name taken directly from Louis Ferdinand Céline's groundbreaking and disturbing post-World War I novel, Journey to the End of the Night, whose protagonist, Bardamu, is fed up with the state of the modern world. Céline's text and protagonist, of course, inaugurated a generation of French writers, including Robert Brasillac and Trieux La Rochelle, who, like Céline, collaborated with the Nazis. However, even after that first appropriation of another author's title, Modiano went on to write Rue des Boutiques Obscures, reminiscent of Perec's La Boutique Obscure, as previously discussed. While the title of Modiano's 1975 novel, Villa Triste, is reminiscent of Borges's Villa Triste le Roi in Death and the Compass, the story we read two weeks ago. Fleur de Ruine, the Flowers of Ruin, Modiano's 1991 novel, alludes to one of the most famous collections of 19th century French poetry, none other than Baudelaire's Les Fleurs du Mal, The Flowers of Evil. Indeed, references to Borges abound in Missing Person. On page 8, Roland finds himself in a, veranda, in a quote, veranda which overlooked a pond. To the left, a small humpback bridge in the Chinese style led to another bungalow on the other side of the pond, end of quote, a setting reminiscent of Borges' story, The Garden of the Forking Paths. Moreover, Modiano peppers his text with references to labyrinths and mazes, recurring themes in Borges. On page 28 of the text, quote, in this labyrinthine maze of buildings, staircases, and elevators, among these hundreds of cubby holes, cubby holes, I had found a man who perhaps, end of quote. The reference to the maze planted by Freddie Howard Deleuze's grandfather on page 59 is reminiscent of Borges' labyrinth as well. Yet Modiano's texts not only refer to other works, but also are highly self-reflexive. Modiano often quotes himself and refers to his other works. In Dora Bruder, for example, he discusses writing his novel Honeymoon as a way of taking a break of his years of fruitless searching for Dora. 
and gives a detailed discussion about the plot and characters of Honeymoon. Indeed, Modiano claims that the female protagonist of Honeymoon, Ingrid, is based upon Dora, and their physical similarities are striking. As with Balzac's 19th century La Comédie Humaine, characters recur throughout Modiano's oeuvre, leading one scholar, Raymond Back, to propose a Balzacian reading of Modiano. Yet in Bach's words, quote, the presence of these characters allows the author to give to his oeuvre as a whole the same kind of ambiguous unity that we find in such individual novels as Rue des Boutiques Obscures. There, the, narrative, the narrator has the strange sensation that everyone he meets is in some way connected to both himself and to one another, but never succeeds in determining the exact nature of his connections." End of quote. In constantly serving the same soup, as has been previously mentioned, Modiano's literary project is one of rewriting, reinscribing his own characters and words, as well as occasionally those of other writers, including their titles. Along with intertextuality and self-referentiality, one of the most important elements of missing person is the intrusion of photography into the text. The very title of the book, the original French title of the book, Rue des Boutiques Obscures, as previously mentioned, is a reference to Perec's work of almost the same title, but it also refers to the birth of the photograph, since the boutique obscure, translatable as the dark chamber, can be taken as the photographic darkroom. This work opens as well as closes with the photograph. At the beginning, it inaugurates the birth of the photographic image, while it ends with an instance of ekphrasis, the rhetorical description of a work of art, one of many found throughout the text. The text opening inaugurates the birth of the photograph. Guy claims, quote, I am nothing, nothing but a pale shape, silhouetted that evening against the cafe terrace, waiting for the rain to stop. End of quote. Like the photographic image waiting to be developed, Guy is, quote, nothing but a pale shape. He is silhouetted, the silhouette being the historical precursor of the photograph. Against the darkness of the evening, Guy is pale, fuzzy, waiting to take shape, much like the photographic image, which waits in the darkroom for the moment that it, too, will appear. A few lines later, and a few hours earlier, quote, the opaline lamp shed a bright light which dazzled me, end of quote. Here, Roland is under the bright glare of a lamp, much like the photographic paper in the dark room, its image appearing only after the exposure to light. Roland is not a fully developed person. Like the half-developed photograph, the pale shape, he lingers in the dark room underneath the light that will reveal his image, himself, his past. From this opening allusion to photography, the text enacts numerous instances of photographic ekphrasis, uh, which is defined uh, on your sheet. It is the description of a work of art in a, in a text. In describing these photographs, Roland tries to find himself in them, often to no avail. He claims he sees himself in some of the photographs, but when he asks others, they do not agree with him. On page 26 to 27, in describing one of the photographs given to him by Schiappa, he claims, quote, and toward the left, his right arm cut off by the edge of the picture, his hand on the shoulder of the blonde young woman, an extremely tall man in a broken check lounge suit, about 30 years old, with dark hair and a thin mustache. I was convinced it was me, end of quote. 
Consider the exchange between Stiapa and the narrator in which the narrator insists that he is in this photograph, much to Stiapa's disagreement. According to Stiapa, quote, looks like you? No. Why? Roland's extensive use of ekphrasis, of describing works of photography, is bound up with his project of investigation, an act of detection. In describing these photographs, he hopes to penetrate the past, and in his determination to find his past, he envisions himself in numerous old photographs, such as on page 65, where he discusses, quote, some photographs. I appear in two of them, end of quote. Roland even considers himself to be the equivalent of the beach man on page 47, Quote, this man had spent 40 years of his life on the beaches or by the sides of swimming pools, chatting pleasantly with summer visitors and rich idlers. He is to be seen in his bathing costume in the corners and backgrounds of thousands of holiday snaps. I felt that the beach man was myself. Hutt was always saying that we were all beach men in the end, and that the sand keeps the traces of our footprints for only a few minutes." End of quote. The ills of history, then, are cleansed, washed away, leaving no traces of its victims, whose footprints, too, disappear. Not only, though, does Roland describe actual photographs, claiming to find his image in them, but he even, upon occasion, creates photographs. And I refer to page 83. Gradually, my eyes got used to this too bright light. I stood there, gazing at the gray walls and the shining panels of the door. A mental picture flashed before me, like those fragments of some fleeting dream which one tries to hold on to in waking, so as to be able to reconstruct the whole dream. I saw myself walking through a dark Paris and opening the door to this building in Rue Cambacérès. Then my eyes were suddenly blinded and for a few seconds I could see nothing. So great was the contrast between this white light and the night outside. This passage is particularly rich since in it some of missing person's most important elements, such as the dream, life as a dream, Roland's existence as a dream, the text as a dream, as well as the permeation of night and its juxtaposition with light. In other words, the attempt to shed light upon the darkness of the past, of history, are found. Once again, here, Roland is comparable to the photographic image that appears only after its exposure to light. He is under an intensely bright light which allows for the mental picture, I cite the text, to flash up before his eyes. His mind, then, is the dark room that develops the photograph, which, like the dream, is fleeting. The dream and the picture are housed in his mind, appearing only when exposed to light, but disappearing when overexposed, much like the photograph. The literal blindness Roland experiences, although temporary, alludes to his condition of metaphoric blindness when he tries to reconstruct his past. His blindness, his living in the fog of memory, is not alleviated by the volumes of photographs he acquires. Indeed, each photograph, paradoxically, can be said to serve to almost increase his blindness. While he attempts to investigate the pictures through detailed descriptions, through ekphrasis, this act of detection only leaves him more confused, giving him nothing of himself. Rather than clarifying his search and illuminating his past, the pictures serve to further drive it into obscurity, into the boutique obscure. He scrutinizes these pictures as if he is blind, with the hope that they will let him see. But none of them give him insight into himself, into who he is. 
the pictures become simply another guess in the catalog of aporias that form the whole of his memory. These endless gaps are not to be filled by the careful, detailed observations of the photographs. Roland's mind is truly a dark room in more than the photographic sense, because his memories are shrouded in the darkness, in the obscurity of this container. In this sense, the original title of the book, Rue des Boutiques Obscures, refers not only to the photographic darkroom, but to the dark room of the protagonist's mind, which can but fabricate memories just as fleeting as his real ones. These encounters of word and image, photography and memory, demonstrate that the text's appropriation of the photographic image goes beyond mere imitation. These instances of photographic ekphrasis characterize and disrupt the work of memory and mourning within missing person. By examining photography's incorporation into missing person's network of meanings, it is clear that photographs play the role of more than simply authenticating background detail. William van der Wolk argues that the photograph becomes another tool in Modiano's ironic construction of a historical slash autobiographical slash fictional narrative, end of quote, to which I add that the photographs become tools of detection, albeit ineffective, in missing person. The photographic ekphrases centering upon the images of women are worth noting in pursuing a photographic reading of missing person. Both the text's major female characters, Denise Coudreuse and Gay Orlov, are imbricated with photography. Denise is a former fashion model whose old print work Roland tracks down. As previously mentioned, the text closes with the description of Gay Orlov as a child, enacting a progression from the fleeting, momentary unhappiness of childhood to the lingering misery of adulthood and eventual inescapable death that is inscribed in each picture, particularly, subjects whose, particularly pictures whose subjects are already dead. Recall Roland Barthes, words that, quote, every photo is this catastrophe, end of quote, this catastrophe of death. The ekphrastic description of Gay's photograph does not only inaugurate a backwards progression in time to the time of Gay's childhood, to the era before the war, the occupation, her sham marriages, her suicide, but also enacts a progression from Polynesia, where Roland's search has taken him, to the pre-war Russian setting of the photograph of Gay. This picture, then, becomes one of missing persons' many instances of movement between times, cultures, and national borders. Moreover, in this picture, the young Gay is crying, in contradiction to her name, which implies happiness. Yet her name, like Guy Roland, is a fabrication, an Americanization of her Russian name, Mara. The adult gay was a party girl who ran in glamorous circles and frequented real historical actors such as Lucky Luciano, the famous gangster. Yet the image with which the text closes is that of her in tears, forever frozen in her unhappy childhood moment. Are her tears here a prediction of the unhappiness that would plague her life, causing her to kill herself before she reached the age of 30? And I would also like to discuss the images of Denise Coudreuse. Um, Denise is also a very contradictory figure. She's uh, associated with photography much in the way that Gay is associated with the photograph. Uh, Denise, from the outset, is presented as a fashion model um, her association with photography is unmistakable. She is also in the group of people of, of whom Guy believes he belongs, uh, during the, who hid uh, over the border in Switzerland during the occupation of France. She is the only quote-unquote legitimate French citizen. Um, 
yet she is the only one who seems to have disappeared uh, completely without a trace, too, when she really um, could have been saved because of her uh, her French nationality and French citizenship, as opposed to the other characters who had forged passports, forged documents, um, who claimed to be Dominican diplomats under the protection of Porfirio Ruby Rosa, who is another historical character who comes into this text. Um, and I think that the, the association of women with photography, with mystery, and with uh, contradictory uh, characteristics, uh, gay, like gi, um, which is an interesting uh, juxtaposition, gay and gi, um, has moved from her birth, uh, her place of birth, Russia, to America, to France. Um, uh, although Guy seems to be the one wandering as the detective wanders uh, as part of his investigation throughout Paris, throughout Europe, uh, throughout the world, many of these other characters are also wandering, searching, uh, displaced. They are displaced citizens, expatriates, um, moving between borders and nationalities that makes for a very uh, complex and rich uh, tapestry of, um, of cultures found in the text, much as in a Borges, uh, which also appropriates different religious, uh, national, linguistic uh, traditions. And um, I would just like to conclude with a quote from a scholar about um, really the, the charm and the sedu seductiveness of Modiano's text, which can really take you in, um, really kind of seduces you, yet at the end leaves you feeling somewhat empty since nothing has been resolved, uh, nothing has been answered, um, which is very uh, forcefully presented in Missing Persons since it, since it ends with a question mark. Um, thus, according to Martine Goyo Bender, um, On a historical level, Modiano is working through the past of an entire generation born after the war in order to allow all of us to forget and to move on. This is what gives Modiano's novels their charm. We are swept into the web by the lure of a common fascination with an era that we cannot have known. Through investigation, memory, repetition, and a coming to writing, Modiano's narrators represent each one of us as we come to terms with our historical and individual pasts." Um, end of quote. And this notion of a coming to writing uh, as part of the project of detection is very important. Um, as you'll recall, Hutt, who retires from the private detective business at the beginning of the text, uh, becomes a librarian, or decides to become a librarian. and. Um, the letters that come from the other detective, uh, Bernardi, is also are also very important um, clues throughout the text. And so, this the project of detection as um, the project of writing or the project of photography is something uh, to consider as well in this text. Um, thank you very much.